Well, good morning. To set the scene for us this morning, we're going to begin in um, John chapter 4. Um, and just to remind you all what's happening up to this point, Jesus is traveling from Judea, and he's making his way back to his home base of Galilee. But he has to stop through some enemy territory in Samaria. Yeah. The disciples leave him alone and he go, as they go into town to buy food, and Jesus is at a well. Verses from the NRSV, verses 7 through 15 say, A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone in the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming to draw water. Verses 16 through 19 continue. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you are with now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Jesus and the woman then engage in some theological dialogue about a place of worship. But Jesus tells her that there is a day coming in which people will worship in spirit rather than one single appointed place. Verses 25 and 26 say, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ, and when he comes he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. The disciples then approach the situation, but they don't dare say a word to either the woman or Jesus. Verse 28 picks up, The woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who has told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left their city and they were on their way to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. I want to take you all on a journey with me around the world. During the calendar year of 2018, I had the opportunity to take three overseas trips to Israel and Palestine, to South Africa, and to New Zealand. So we begin in the desert. But I want you to think about water. Have you ever been without it? I want you to think about this image of living water that Jesus is promising to a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. But I also want you to think about the reality of big black tanks on top of concrete Palestinian homes. Water was a place in John 4 where a Jew and a Samaritan came together. And yet today, water is a thing that continues to tear apart Israeli and Palestinian people. On the fifth day of my journey in Israel, I started the morning at Jacob's well, the site where these events in John 4 took place. Jesus worked in spite of the societal differences that divided the two of them. But that afternoon, I got on a bus and I rode in and out of the West Bank as I made my way through Palestinian territories. This was my first day to see anything in Palestine. And I saw the differences between Israel that I had experienced for four days and now Palestine. The terrain of the land was different. The lush green of Galilee of Israel was good for planting and for growing. And yet in Palestine, I could see rocks and dry soil. Not as good for growth. 
Did you know that there are big black water tanks on top of Palestinian homes? This is because the Israeli government controls all fresh water in the Holy Land. And when water starts to get low, they cut off Palestinian water. And they don't know when it's going to come back on. This happens anywhere between three and four times in one week. So Palestinian people put these tanks on top of their houses so that way they have water when it's cut off. Water scarcity is not just present in our current time. The Samaritan woman did not have running water in her house either. So she had to walk to a well to draw water. During this time, relationship between Samaritan and Jews was not good. In the eyes of Jewish people, Samaritans were unclean, uneducated, and easily hated. And yet Jesus approaches a Samaritan. Not just a plain Samaritan person, but a woman. In this day and age, it was unfit for a, woman to for a man to approach a woman he is not related to. And Jesus doesn't just stop at speaking to her, but he asks to share a drink of water with her. Verse 9, the author of the Gospel of, of Luke, or John, takes the time to remind us of this relationship between Jews and Samaritans. It takes the time in the narrative to say, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. But there is hope. The simple action of sharing water by Jesus reminds me that the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for all people, for the entire world, for Jews and Samaritans and Gentiles and women and men and Israelis and in Palestinians and me and you. The living water that Jesus speaks about is perhaps the glue that can bring back the two broken pieces of Israel and Palestine back together in harmony. On my trip, it was water that brought laughter to my Palestinian tour guide and my Jewish professor as I had spilled it on my lap at lunch. Perhaps the living water that Jesus speaks about can bring back together the broken pieces of your life as well. Because of this, I have hope for us as followers of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ challenges the division between people because Jesus himself challenged his own societal divisions of his time. Even today, the gospel transforms the world by challenging divisions. The gospel of Jesus Christ is transforming the world. So now I want us to move to another place where societal divisions have long plagued history. And that is the place of South Africa, the home of the apartheid movement. Have you ever had a time where you were silenced just because of who you are and what you look like? What does it feel like to not be heard? How would the Samaritan woman have reacted if Jesus had silenced her? In South Africa, I sat around a table from many people from different countries speaking many languages. My table in particular needed a translator because not every person around my table spoke English primarily. So our discussions took longer than normal conversation. Between the language barrier and the contentious topics in which we were discussing, our small group sessions were heated by passion and misunderstanding. I was not immune to getting caught up in the moment. At one point, I caught myself preparing a really good response for my brother across the table from me, but I wasn't listening to him. I was mentally preparing my response into what he was saying when my job was to listen. It was in South Africa that I experienced the inner tug between the desire to speak and the desire to listen. In John 4, there is clear dialogue between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Jesus speaks to her, but he also listens to her. It would have been really easy for Jesus to cut her off, to interrupt what she was saying, and even to correct her when she's confused about who he is. But instead, he listens to her, allowing her to speak the truth, speak what she thinks, and then speak what she knows. In South Africa, I came to see the importance of listening to others, not necessarily the importance of speaking to get my personal, well thought out opinion across. 
because I took the time to listen to those around my table, no matter how painful it was because of misunderstanding and disagreement, I got more out of my experience. The other members of my small group often prioritized listening as well, and we thrived in our discussion because of this agreement. The gospel of Jesus Christ compels us to go out and to tell others about it, absolutely. And yet at the same time, it compels us to love other people by listening to them and giving them the space to speak what they think and speak what they know. Even today, the gospel transforms the world by compelling us to listen to others. The gospel of Jesus Christ is transforming the world. And now we take ourselves to New Zealand. New Zealand, you may not know, is the home of the first ever women's suffrage movement, hokey pokey ice cream, and my very favorite coffee drink, the flat white. Now, New Zealand may not seem as famous as our other destinations for major controversies, but it is home to some of the cleanest air on the entire planet. Because it is so clean, you can breathe deep and see for miles. Have you ever felt truly seen? Have you ever been so vulnerable and so clear and yet accepted by people that you almost feel a weight completely lifted off your shoulders? Can you imagine the anxiety that Samaritan woman must have felt as a Jewish man was approaching her? Here she is at a well at high noon, the most visible part of the day. Everyone can see her and now her enemy is walking towards her but she does not get what she's expecting from him. The Samaritan woman in John 4 receives authentic community with Jesus Christ. Jesus points out to the Samaritan woman her multiple husbands. He sees her for exactly who she is. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't rebuke her. But instead he speaks kindly to her and he speaks freedom to her. And what did the woman do after being seen so clearly by Jesus? She leaves her water jug behind her and runs into the city to tell others about Jesus. She is compelled to go into that town, go back to her community of Samaritan people and talk about her wonderful encounter with a Jewish man. Verse 39 of chapter four gives us an update on what happened to the Samaritan woman. It says many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked to stay with him, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. On the last night on my trip to New Zealand, our team shared reflections from the week. I watched a group of seven women, well into their 70s, brought to tears as they described the formative experiences that they had on the trip and how it impacted them. They loved the beautiful scenery of the country and they loved the delicious food that we took part in, but each talked about the power of being seen. Many of these women were recently widowed. And that night they opened up to everybody about the feelings of loneliness that they had been feeling leading up into our trip. One even described to us her past few months battling with depression, and yet the community that we all experienced traveling through this beautiful country brought them to tell others about what they were struggling with. They felt seen for exactly who they are and loved despite their flaws. The gospel of Jesus Christ allows us the space to be vulnerable, to be seen for exactly who we are, and it gives us beautiful community with one another. Even today, the gospel transforms the world by drawing us to community. The gospel of Jesus Christ is transforming the world. You may not be the person to solve every international water crisis. You may not be the person that teaches everyone how to disagree gracefully, and you may not comfort every widow in their sadness but you can donate to organizations who are building wells. You can listen to those whom which you disagree with better. You can be drawn to see someone in your community. I don't believe that we have to travel the world to see that the gospel transforms the world. This sort of kingdom seeking work can be done no matter where you are. So I pray that perhaps in this calendar year, we may all be compelled to open our eyes to see the situations around us in which God is working and how the gospel is interacting with our corners of the world. 
challenging divisions, compelling us to listen, drawing us to community. Even today, the gospel of Jesus Christ is transforming the world.